I've had a number of people ask me how I make my weather forecast, where does it come from, where do the maps come from, where does the data on the iPhone app that you have come from. So I thought it would just be interesting to dive into weather forecasting and especially the computer models that run a lot of the forecasts that we have. So throughout this video, a few things we're going to talk about. One is just where those models come from and then we're also going to touch into what is the point of weather men or broadcast meteorologists and what what do they add to the forecast like could the computer just do everything so we'll just dive in here the power of computers in weather forecasting so the advancement of technology has greatly impacted various aspects of our lives and weather forecasting is no exception that's especially true if you look at a weather forecast from like 1950 they literally have like cardboard maps behind them and they're like moving the picture of the sun and it's not a guess they were surprisingly good knowing like what was going to happen with pressure changes and whatnot but uh, it's come a very long way I'll put it that way so with the help of computers meteorologists are now now able to make more accurate predictions about the weather in this article we will dive into the world of numerical weather prediction hardest class I've ever taken in my entire life and understand how computers have revolutionized the field of weather forecasting. So I just mentioned numerical weather prediction. This class, I took it in my master's program at San Jose State, and it was basically trying to write the code that interprets that data that goes into your iPhone app. So how it basically works, I'm sure it's going to get into it right here, but I'll just give you a basic summary. So maybe what we're reading makes a little more sense. There's governing equations of meteorology, and there's lots of different variables in the atmosphere, temperature, wind, precipitation, humidity. And you can basically solve those equations for those variables. And then if you do this five minutes from now, you know your forecast then. And then you can use that to be able to you use those variables to then predict what it's going to be 10 minutes from now and then 15. And you can just forecast incrementally over time using each forecast as the baseline to solve those equations. Now that probably made no sense whatsoever. So we're just going to continue to read. The one other aspect I should add is you're solving those equations within grid boxes that make up the entire atmosphere. So some of these models will have 50 different levels or the boxes will be the one I used for my master's program was two kilometers by two kilometers. So you're solving all those calculations within each of those boxes all over the earth and then up into the atmosphere. So if that didn't make sense, that's why we're going to continue reading here. Hopefully that gives you a general idea though. So numerical weather prediction. Numerical weather prediction refers to the routine daily forecasting of the weather by computers. The process starts with the collection of thousands of observations transmitted to National Centers for Environmental Prediction. NSEP. So where do these observations come from? It's there's weather stations just all over the place. And I've actually set a few I've set up a couple of these myself and takes lots of different readings, the classics, temperature, wind, humidity, and a number of others. And then you take all those observations from all over the Earth's surface and then also from weather balloons that go up into the air. And then you get plug that into the models and you get a good idea of what the atmosphere looks like right now. So then you can change that little time increment and then figure out what it's going to be like five minutes in the future. So just reading on here, these observations are then fed into a high speed computer, which plots and draws lines or surface on surface and upper air charts. Meteorologists then interpret the weather patterns and make corrections to any errors that may be present. The final chart is referred to as an analysis. So the two main ways to make your weather forecast better, one is to make those grid boxes smaller. Like any, anybody on the California coast knows that if you're right on the coast, it might be 50 degrees and you drive one to two miles inland and it might be 70 degrees. That's like the microclimates of California. So if you have one box that's three miles, it'll just spit out 60 degrees for that whole area. But if you can have smaller boxes, it's able to have a higher resolution picture of what's going on in the atmosphere. The other way is to use smaller time increments as well. 
but both of those things take more computing power. So it's the balance between your forecast is useless if it takes so long to run the computers that you don't have the forecast by the time that day happens, but then you also want it as high resolution as possible so that the forecast is accurate. So just reading on here, mathematical models of the atmosphere. To accurately predict the weather, meteorologists have created mathematical models of the atmosphere that describe the present state of the atmosphere. These models are not physical models that paint a picture of a developing storm, but, rath but rather mathematical models consisting of dozens of equations that describe how atmospheric temperature, pressure, winds, and moisture will change with time. So that's what I was trying to say earlier, where it's literally equations for like temperature, wind, humidity, and then you can use your observations to solve those equations and then increment it forward in time. And if you want examples of this, I believe I actually have a few videos on my channel where I'm deriving these equations and it doesn't even, it looks like gibberish. It's the classic like weird math symbols all over it and then you have to manipulate it in all these weird ways in order for the equations to work. It's I'm very happy that as a weather forecaster, I don't have to do the math by hand, and we, in large part, have computers doing the math for us. But again, there are aspects that the weather forecaster as a person does add, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the models are programmed into the computer and fed with surface and upper air observations of temperature, pressure, moisture, winds, air density. We've talked about that already. So predicting the weather. To determine how each of these variables will change, each equation is solved for a small increment of future time, such as five minutes, for a large number of locations called grid points, which are situated a given distance apart. That's what I was trying to explain earlier. You have your time increment and you have your space increment. You want your both of those to be as small as possible. In addition, each equation is solved for as many as 50 levels in the atmosphere. So it's not just the surface of the Earth, it's all these grid points all over the surface of the Earth, but then also going way up into the atmosphere. The result of these computations are then fed back into the original equations, and then the computer solves the equations again, predicting the weather for the next five minutes. This process is repeated until it reaches the desired time in the future, usually 12, 24, 36, or 48 hours. So you have all your observations, you put them into your equations, figure out what the atmosphere is doing right now. Then you use that model of the atmosphere, increment it forward in time, solve the equations again, you have your forecast. And then you use that to make your next forecast, and you just keep doing that over and over again until you have you've gone out as far as you want for your forecast. And it gets worse the farther you go out because any mistake you make at the beginning is going to ripple over time, almost like the butterfly effect. So the computer then prints this information, analyzes it, and draws the projected positions of pressure systems with their isobars or contour lines. That's like your low pressure coming in or like a cold front or something like that. The final forecast chart representing the atmosphere at a specified future time is called a prognostic chart. Not exactly a term you hear very often. So the role of meteorologists, where do I come into the picture? So meteorologists use the prognostic charts as a guide. You know, that's a key word right there. You use it as guidance. You don't just accept the model 100% because there are errors in the model. So you use it as a guide in making weather predictions. They have access to a variety of models, each producing a slightly different interpretation of the weather for the same projected time and atmospheric level. So for example, two of the big models that are used, GFS is like the big American model, and then ECMWF is the good European model. Now a lot of people will say that ECMWF is better, but in reality, they're both good at different things. So sometimes, depending on what kind of weather event's coming in, you'll look to one model and then trust that one a little bit more than the other. And that's part of what the weather forecaster can bring into the picture is you don't always want to just go with one model. Sometimes the other one actually is better, depending on the event that you're looking at. 
So the differences between these models may result from the way the models use the equations or the distance between grid points. Some models predict certain features better than others. It's important to note that the forecaster makes a prediction based on the guidance of the computer, their own practical interpretation of the weather situation, and any local geographic features that influence the weather within the specific forecast area. That was pretty wordy. But I do want to touch on that last thing about local geographic features. That's very important when it comes to forecasting because especially, for example, on the central coast, you have lots of different microclimates and lots of different elevation and there's just a lot going on. So if you have, if your grid box that those equations were solved for covers, I've sort of explained this, too large of an area, too large of a space, it might be a good average of that area, but overall there's going to be huge differences in there. And then if there are some local features, like maybe some little ridge or valley or something that the model is not at high of resolution enough to bring that into the picture and use that information to create its prediction, that's where you can come in as the weather forecaster. So for example, I remember during winter, the models were just consistently saying Salinas Valley overnight was going to be a few degrees warmer than it actually was going to be. And we kept seeing this feature and it's very important because there's lots of farming in the Salinas Valley and if they don't take the necessary precautions overnight to cover plants or things like that because they think it's going to be warmer, they can literally lose millions of dollars. So as a weather forecaster, we see, okay, this is where the model's wrong and then we're able to change our forecast based on how we know the model's wrong. So that's why the model is guidance, but it's not your, just exactly what you're going to say. So next good question, why are forecasts sometimes wrong? And this is like the joke, everybody says, weather forecaster, that's the only job you could be wrong half the time and keep your job. But there's, it's very complex stuff going on and it's, I may be a little biased here, but I'm actually surprised how accurate it is. When you think about the complexity of the atmosphere, it is insane that up to three days out, the models are pretty good at this point in time, and then they're just rapidly improving. So in the next decade, it'll probably be really good five days out, and then eventually a full week, and then even longer than that. So despite the use of advanced technology, weather forecasts are not always accurate as everybody knows. <laughs> there are a number of factors that can contribute to inaccurate forecasts, including the complex and dynamic nature of the atmosphere, the limitations of mathematical models, and the variability of weather patterns. I would also add on to there like the limits of computational resources, because one of the big things that's going to allow weather forecasts to get better is as our computers become stronger, basically. So, however, meteorologists continue to work towards improving the accuracy of weather forecasts by incorporating new data and developing more advanced models. So, conclusion. In conclusion, computers have revolutionized the field of weather forecasting. That's safe to say. The use of numerical weather prediction and mathematical models of the atmosphere has greatly improved the accuracy of weather forecasts. And while weather forecasts are not always 100% accurate, as we all know, Meteorologists continue to work toward making more accurate predictions by incorporating new data and developing more advanced models. So, basic summary there. Um, your weather forecast in large part is made by computer models which utilize observational data to solve the governing equations of meteorology for variables like temperature, wind, and rain for within a massive number of grid boxes within the Earth's atmosphere, or representing the Earth's atmosphere. So where does the weather forecaster come in? A good broadcast meteorologist is able to kind of interpret that data, tell a very concise story while conveying the overall threat level. That's always a pretty important aspect. And then not only that, they're also able to use their experience and local knowledge to know where the models are wrong. And that might be the most important part. But eventually we'll 
computers and AI get so good at forecasting and even so good at communicating that forecast that the weatherman is replaced, most likely. But I'm happy to say that day is not here yet. So hopefully this video was helpful and thanks for watching.